So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats for starting. I would like, first of all, to welcome you here on behalf also of our president, Professor Kostas Gramenos, who is in England, cannot be with us today. Also on behalf of the other members of the governing board present here. Uh, it's always a pleasure in our university to welcome distinguished speakers like Apostolos Doxiadis who, of course, combines uh, a lot of attributes, uh, well known as author, but of course what I personally like very much is his background in mathematics, logic, all these things that he uh, one notices reading his texts, the clear thinking and the vision, something that uh, not only this country, but especially this country desperately needs at the moment to uh, pass uh, through a very, very difficult phase. So it's uh, a pleasure for me personally I am looking forward to listening to him, but I would like to ask the Dean of uh, the School of Humanities, uh, Professor Vasilis Gunaris, to come to the floor to present the author. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I do apologize for my sore throat. Uh, I wish I could say that my voice is trembling because of tension or excitement, but I'm afraid it's just a common laryngitis, and you have to live with that. Anyway, I'm, I am delighted and excited to present, to welcome and to present Apostolos Toxiadis here. Uh, a perfect example of a modern home universalis, a mathematician, essentially, dressed as an artist, an author, a writer, or perhaps vice versa, and also dressed as a mathematician. And uh, an author of the essay of worldwide distinctions uh, for his books, all of them were bestsellers, uh, translated in too many languages all around the globe. Uh, when I read the first book, uh, Uncle Peter and, and the Goldbach Conjecture, I said, my God, had I read that book in my teens, I would have become a mathematician. Uh, I did not. When I read Logic Comics, I was no less impressed by Bertrand Russell's thought. But again, it was too late to, to become a philosopher. In fact, uh, it was too late for any regrets uh, in my life. In any case, I never expected to, to discuss with Apostles Doxiadis history, at least not in, in terms of, of theory. And then he gave us a strange subtitle for uh, tonight's talk. What does it mean to know what happened on the morning of December 3rd, 1944 in Constitution Square in Athens? I said, what kind of subtitle under the title History, Historic Truth, Scientific, Judicial, Literary? Let me tell you a, a brief story, rather uh, personal, which perhaps will amplify what he intends to say. Uh, when I entered the university, I met this girl, uh, everybody does, and, and she came from a leftist family, of a leftist uh, family background. And uh, we had a lot of fights about politics. Mind you, it was in the late 1970s and we had heated debates, and um, all of them ended up in, in the civil war. And where should we put the blame? And uh, I was not a trained historian then, I was just entered the university. So I started to, to examine, is there an alternative view? For my family background, there was no alternative view of the events. So the Civil War was the core of all this dispute, and, and, and uh, we never came to a conclusion. So I started to read one after the other books about these events, and I realized that in order to find out what happened in the Civil War, you had to go uh, back to what happened in, in uh, early December uh, in Athens. And then the, the question was narrowed down to what really happened that very day. Whom should we blame for that? Who shot uh, first? And I was seeking evidence. And I, anyway, I was just a second year uh, student. 
perhaps more desperate to, to keep my relation going than to find the ultimate historical truth. And so tonight, Apostle Zoxiadis will do that for us with his beautiful mind. Thank you, Apostolos. Okay, can you all hear me? Okay, uh, good evening, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Professor Wunneris, for your generous introduction. Uh, I don't know, I, I can understand that a professional historian, academic historian is shocked by me giving a histor history as a uh, part of this lecture, one of the privileges of being an author and not a mathematician, I, I do not declare myself a mathematician, I am a an author and one of the beauties of being an author is that you can be anyone you want and you can change and I enjoy that, I enjoy changing from book to book and from project to project and but also in the past uh, 10 years or so, parallel to my purely literary work or literary, I don't know if you, some of you count comics as literature, I do, a sort of strange new literature, but as part of my literary work, uh, I have veered off into another direction and for the past six, seven years have produced a series of papers that can be um, academically counted as history. It's, a, of course, a very special kind of history, the history of its cognitive history, and especially the history of ancient mathematics and the birth of proof, the genesis of the process of proof. So, though I do not declare myself an academic historian, I am also somewhat involved uh, more seriously in the past few years with history. But, of course, history interests me principally because it's a form of storytelling. Now, that is a statement that many historians would not accept, and there are certain schools of history which have uh, created themselves, created their reputation. Uh, I will need some form of uh, time measuring device up here, a watch or something, to keep track of time. Okay, thanks. I call the time measuring device for the nature, for the sake of our scientists here. It's more formal. Um, I, as a storyteller, I'm interested in history also as a form of storytelling. But many historians do not accept the fact not that history is also storytelling because that, as we shall see, is very hard to deny. But that it is principally storytelling, and I will not take no position in, on that, and I will take no position, I'm sorry to say, or let's say no final position on it, and I will take no position in the end of the lecture on the issue that uh, troubled Professor Wunneris in his earliest youth, uh, of what exactly happened. I will be speaking a lot about it on that in a particularly important day for uh, Greek, modern Greek history, I'll tell you more about it, but I will not give an answer, so it wouldn't be a way of getting the girl back, but st <laughs> still. Well, I will talk about positivist approaches. Now, um, since Bertrand Russell was mentioned, ben Bertrand Russell once said that in order to do philosophy, you have to make yourself artificially stupid. And I think that's a lovely quote, and um, I would say that what I love about interdisciplinary audiences, like the one tonight is, especially so, and wonderfully so, young people who have come from very different disciplines. We have 
people working in computer science, in economics, in uh, archaeology, in history, in political science. One of the things is that you don't need to make yourself artificially stupid. You have to be artificially stupid in order to speak well to a mixed audience because you cannot assume expertise in any one of the fields because although we have many experts in any particular field, we probably have very few that are experts in all of them. So you have to go lower your common denominator, and that is wonderful because I think that is the way you think anew, that even experts can think new and original thoughts is sometimes by making themselves artificially stupid even in their own field. So though I'm doing it supposedly for the sense of a common denominator of an interdisciplinary audience, I think that even historians may find what I have to say interesting because they will have to renounce their expertise at first and for a while bear with me and make themselves artificially stupid. I am naturally stupid, so I have no problem adapting to that. So this is a wonderful portrait of Clio, the muse of history, drawn by Vermeer in a very mysterious and uh, appealing painting called The Allegory of Painting. And for some reason, in The Allegory of Painting, Vermeer shows us an artist from his back painting this young model holding a trumpet and book, and that is the symbolism for the muse of history. I cannot really understand why The Allegory of Painting is, includes a picture of history. Perhaps, they say, because in Vermeer's time, uh, many of the subjects of historical uh, of paintings were historical, but still I find it an intriguing fact. Now, issue is what is history? I cannot answer that, as I said, because not, I don't think anyone really can, or even those who can will have a problem if you put many of them in a room because they will disagree with one another about what they agree on. So let us bypass that. Uh, let me also bypass a big, huge philosophical question, really, which is what is historical truth? And I'm not also a philosopher. I'm an amateur in that, as in many other things, being a writer. And let me pass to a more practical question. What does it mean to know a historical truth? And that, as we say, is an, ep is an epistemological problem. It's a problem having to do with knowledge and not with substance, a philosophy might say, not with being, but how we know being, how knowledge of being. And I think that is something more, I'm more familiar with because I have thought about all sorts of truths in my life, having changed subjects and done many things, and the different criteria of truth in each one. So, well, what does it mean? What does the question, what does it mean to know something mean? Uh, let me tell you something that you may find much more boring, but to some of you may be more interesting and to others not at all, but to me was interesting for a long time in my life. I will refer to three types of knowledge that are common to science or natural science, the natural sciences. And we have diff three different paradigms, as they say, of what knowledge is that are quite different. And I think with these three, and especially the latter two, we can more or less deal with uh, historical truth and ask the question, is it a scientific truth? Because the first question I want to ask is, is historical truth scientific? Do we know it in the sense that we know science? But we don't know all science in the same way. We know mathematical truth in one way and scientific truth in different ways. So the way in which we know that the Pythagorean theorem is true means practically, let's give a, a practical test, that if we are given any right triangle in the ideal or non-ideal universe and are told that it's right tri a right triangle, we can be certain that the square of its hypotenuse is equal to the square of any of the, the sum of the squares of the other two sides. That is a particular way of knowledge that is totally certain, is totally controllable, and is perhaps unique to mathematics or logic perhaps, but many people this, uh, consider logic or formal logic certainly is a branch of mathematics. 
And it has to do with the epistemological peculiarity of mathematics, that in mathematics you define your universe, your world. It's like a computer game in a sense, uh, before you begin to play. Or like a board game, if you play Monopoly, you define the rules of Monopoly. If you play chess, you define the rules. You cannot play chess suddenly and say, tonight I feel I would like, like Anand and Carlsen, as you may know, are playing now for the world title. It is not an option for Anand suddenly to say, I'm in a difficult position here. I decide that the knight today will move diagonally. You cannot do that. It's against the rules. So mathematics is in that sense like chess or like Monopoly or like a video game, which has its own rules built into it. And because its own rules and its own, own universe are built into it, you can really say things with certainty because nothing can jump in from the outside. I will show you two images more. Let me call type two. You would see a slide here that shows uh, the three-dimensional structure of DNA, the oxyribonucleic acid, which is a double helix, okay? It is, imagine a spiral and another spiral going down together in parallel. And that, as was discovered in the early 50s, is the three-dimensional structure of DNA. Now, what does it mean to know the three-dimensional structure of DNA? Does it mean the same as the Pythagorean theorem? Well, in theory, yes. But not really, not just that. There is an exception. The exception is that we cannot rule out the possibility that in the future or tomorrow or today, a sample of DNA may be found that does not have the structure of the double helix. It is extremely unlikely, it is against all theory, but the thing with the natural science as opposed to mathematics is that because reality is externally defined and not inside the field, there is no a priori reason to think that it cannot upset theory. So if a new strand of DNA is discovered and does not have the structure of a double helix, biologists, geneticists, and so on will have a huge problem. I told you about DNA. I'll call this type two knowledge. It's type two knowledge which is practically certain. We know it's there, we know why it's there, we, have, we understand everything, but no one can exclude uh, something coming and upsetting the theory. And type three knowledge is what does it mean to know the number of planets in our solar system? Now, with the state of our observation instruments at the moment, it would be a huge and enormous surprise if we realize that there are more than the nine major planets. That's probably unlikely. But we also have dwarf planets like uh, Ceres and so on coming up. And it's not at all unlikely that a new dwarf planet will appear. And if you look at the science news every now and then, somebody discovers one or every 10 years or so. So that will not be a surprise, and that harms the theory not at all. That does not harm the theory. That's fine. We assimilate that too. Another dwarf planet. No model is upset. Okay? So you see, we have three types of knowledge. One, total certainty before, because self-enclosed. The second, uh, highly susceptible to falsification. If falsification happens, there's a huge upset. Third, new data new, are fine. We just stick them in. Now, uh, assume that this is, uh, look at this basic time line, which is from about uh, classical, the, the classical times, classical Greece, and roughly to the uh, present time. Type uh, what I will call type three history, the planet knowledge type history, we say was invented in the Western world, at least. I don't have much knowledge about the developments in the Far East, but it was invented in Greece. Hecateus is before Herodotus. He's considered an analyst, a chronographer, but he has some of the elements of a, let us say, scientific historian, the historian who does not want metaphysical explanations, does not want big schemes, but observes what actually happened. And of course, we know Herod Herodotus, Thucydides, Xenophon, and I mentioned just some of the Romans. There are many more Greeks than Romans, but they are type three historians. 
They can have theories, they can be thinking theoretically, and they do sometimes, but they don't mine new data. There is a model in the Middle Ages, there were many more, I just have one from the Western and one from the Eastern tradition, Eusebius, Ecclesiastical History, and Gregory of Tours, and those are authors who write a basically Christian history, and they seem to accept the cosmology of the Christian faith as being stronger than their data. They subsume the data to the theory. They have a theory, they know that DNA is double helical, and they, any new data, they stick into that. And I mentioned over a line the Bible in the Judaic tra tradition and Homer in the Hellenic tradition because the Bible is supposed to be history, and certain parts of it are very, of the Old Testament, are really quite historical, like the Maccabees, for example. And whereas Homer was considered for many Greeks to be at least partly historical. And those worlds are worlds ordained by the gods. So though they are in some way historical, pre, not prehistory in the normal sense, but early history or proto-history or ur-history, we might say using the German term, they set the model for a kind of history which I'll call type two star the, the history. And type two star is almost like uh, type two science, but with a twist. I'll tell you about the twist. Now, in Byzantine times, in medieval times, we have people like uh, Mikhail Pselos or Anna Komnini, Anna Komnena, who take the ancient models, Komnena very consciously, Thucydides, and again try to establish, although they do accept their Christian faith, they try to establish a descriptive kind of history that's closer to type three, type two, type three science. It's under three. Then, of course, there's the big revolutions of the 18th and 19th century, and I just take some important historians from the 18th century to our day, no higher, uh, roughly temporal sequence. I mentioned Hume, Gibbon Michelet, down to Gin Carlo Ginzburg or Tony Judd. Uh, obviously, there are many, many more and many greater, perhaps, but I mention, I give you a choice of different styles of historians who are all, in that sense, can, have no problem in assimilating facts into theories. But interestingly, for, interestingly from the eight of the 18th century, the beginning of Romanticism, to the 19th, to the 20th, they have also been type two star historians, and I'll mention four, Hegel, Marx, uh, Oswald Spengler, German, and Arnold Toynbee, the British. These people have a grand theory of history, either derived from philosophy, as in Hegel mostly, and the rest derived supposedly at least either from philosophy and or observation. They have a grand, I will call it metaphysical scheme, metaphysical in the sense of, of beyond physics or pre-physics, beyond observation, and they like to fit everything into that scheme. Uh, this is my definition of type two science. Type two, but with basic laws impervious to reality. They cannot be hurt by reality. Or if the facts don't agree with theory, something is wrong with the facts, okay? Uh, that is a very unscientific thing, but in grand scheme, what um, the French have called le grand récit, and uh, the, the death of the grand récit, is a very famous postmodernist concept, really is partly also about that. Now, I will conc uh, make the concrete question, what does it mean to know what happened on December 3, 1944, in Syntagma Square, Athens? I gave you already a preview of what happened, what is considered to have happened, this demonstration which turned out in a bloody way. And I'll be coming back and forth to my example, really not to say something about that particular day, but to have an intense event and see how far reason can be applied to it and what are, is, are its limits and what type of paradigms, what types of reason. So let's look at the scientific version of history more closely first. What is the first some strange jumps occur here, but ignore. Uh, what is the first thing we know in science? What is the first thing, the basic thing of uh, science? Let's ask someone not from the natural scientists. Ladies, what is the first thing we know? The most basic thing, what do we know? Give me one word, two words. Yes, yes? Experiment, okay, another offer? From here, from here, please. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll give you something very simple, facts. 
most people would say facts, but it's not facts. That fact is wrong. We know something before facts, and that is traces of facts. The facts don't speak to them to us of themselves. They don't come out and bite us and say, hey, 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 I'm a fact. We have to go looking for facts, and we look at traces of facts. And a trace of facts, for example, is this is the, the very famous uh, first uh, X-ray crystallographic image of DNA that gave the first hints to Watson and Crick that the structure is double helical. So this is an X-ray, and it's a trace of DNA that is useful to scientists. Or these are the spectral, the spectra of various stars, which show the chemical composition of various uh, stars and in our galaxy. And with these, scientists can then talk about their chemical composition. Traces are what we use to go on to facts. In history, traces can be, for example, in the 20th century when we have them pictures. This is one of the two most famous pictures of that day, of December 3rd, 1944. We see this is the, uh, if you know Athens a bit, this is Am Amalia Street, and people walking up towards Constitution Square, which is this way, and policemen in their way blocking them. And this is the most famous picture of that day, which are some of the demonstrators gathered around the, de around the dead. Now, please note something very interesting here, that by putting these two pictures, one next to, a, 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 to the other, and also because of the directionality, even because of this rifle pointing here, I create a mini narrative and to someone who doesn't know anything about this day, looking at these two pictures, they will think that the policeman on the left killed the people on the right, okay? Please hold that in your mind as something that shows that the possible deception inherent even in the simplest narrative, and also the mind's tendency to create narratives even by juxtaposing two pictures. Whether that is the truth or not is not the issue. It could be or it could not be. It is that your minds, for people who don't know Greece or Greek history, they have the immediate result that those policemen killed those people. And that is a cognitive fact. It's not a historical fact. Actual data on that day, for example, here are the notebooks of uh, General Scobie, the British commander, his diaries for that day, and he says, uh, on my way to the office, I, I, sorry, on my way to the office, I passed a very long column, obviously marching toward the main square in defiance of government orders, and so on. And then he goes on to say that he heard some shooting. Now, that is a trace for that day. Here I have a footnote from the well-known book of Johnny Atreides on that day. And here I have the different forms to see also how traces come to us. And the footnote says, the government report reads, the members of the police although mistreated by the demonstrators acting in accordance with orders, showed great patience. It begins so. And that is in quotes because it is a government report, and that is also a trace. And here we have a, a newspaper article published in the late 50s by a right-wing newspaper making a, a review of the December events and speaking to some of the protagonists where the chief of police says, I ordered the evacuation of Syntagma Square, I ordered the police to shoot against them. That is also a trace given to a reporter in a newspaper. These things have to be taken into account, but we have to, to believe that this person is speaking there, perhaps with his words slightly changed. Now, as I said before, this is the hashtag. It's uh, hash31244, if you're interested. So 3rd December 44, if you don't remember, 31244 live. So if you want to tweet anything on that day, keep it, if you have something to tweet, keep, write it or keep it in case something comes up later. And this problematic nature of traces, that traces are not always the direct way into facts or are not very clear data, biologists would say, they're not very clear samples, was known to the first two great type three historians, Herodotus and Thucydides. Uh, Her Herodotus says at near the beginning of his history, opsis te mi ke gnomi ke that this is what I saw, 
what I thought and what I found out, because history in that time meant research originally, looking to find something out, looking, knowing, or searching to find something, knowledge, which is what Herodotus meant. But only in the 19th century, by the father, perhaps, of positivist history, Leopold von Ranke, was the, he, the issue of traces done something about. The main problem with historians, until the time, and for most of history, even today, is that they deal with documents, okay? Archaeology does not deal with documents, history deals with documents mostly. And because they deal with documents, they have contaminated evidence. Now, Ranke was very influenced by sciences developing at that time, biology, the Darwinian type of biology, which traces various species down to more general uh, genera or taxa or other biological categories. Bilinguistics, which the traces, say, a root uh, German, uh, Teutonic, and so on, Celtic, uh, to, to Italo-Celtic, to Greco-Italo-Celtic, whatever, to some Indo-European root. Linguistics was trying to find sources, developmental for languages. And, of course, the prototype for Ranke's revolution was in the great revolution in classical philology occurring at that time in Germany by the notion of what philologists call the stemma. The stemma, uh, S-T-E-W-M-A, is the tree. A philologist has, say, one, two, three, four, five. Each node here is a manuscript of a certain text, let us say, the Oedipus Rex of Sophocles. So a philologist has found 20 old texts, but by studying them, they begin to understand that some are influenced by the other. So this shows the traces of influence here, that there's only one Ur manuscript, one first independent manuscript. And in these ways, all the others derive from it. So when you're studying a manuscript, you should know that. You could have two or three original, in some sense, texts, and we see that in Shakespeare, for example, where for some of his plays, we have two or three editions that are quite different, and we presume that one was published for some reason differently from the other, perhaps from an oral transcription of a performance. Ranke, by inserting this into history, decontaminated his evidence. Until then, historians were often writing history, copying one another, and they mistook another person's view for a fact. But Ranke showed a way to at least be sure of your traces. Now, this looks like a zoological fact. It's a Tyrannosaurus rex, and it looks wonderful in the Natural History Museum, and children love it, but it was not discovered that way, okay? We didn't dig up that skeleton. This is one of famous uh, photograph of one of the great first discoveries in the in, uh, dinosaur fossils. Here we see some of the bones of this monster here as discovered, and they can be even messier than that. And from traces, you have to go to facts. From traces, you have to go to facts. The same is true in history. And uh, you have facts, you have traces, and you go from one to the other. Now, how do you go from the one to the other? First of all, sometimes traces are very few, and you cannot really get to facts. The first thing you may need, and that's why historians help spend half their lives in archives, is more traces. More traces. Then once you have enough traces to start building something, they apply to methods, very traditional, very usual methods, which are called induction and deduction. Now, not everyone is clear about the differences of induction and deduction, and because soon I'll introduce a third method, I want us to be clear on what each one means, and I'll give you a wonderful example I have found somewhere which involves a bag and some white beans, okay? So, it's very easy to remember. Remember, I'll always be playing with the same three sentences. Induction. We know for a fact that we are given a bean, and it is white. And we are told for a fact that it is from that bag, okay? Induction is to say all beans in this bag are white. Okay, with one bean, it's a very, very small sample. But when they become five or ten, we begin to think that they're all white. And in that sense, induction is a statistical form of knowledge. The more you know, the better is your, the greater is your certainty. Deduction is that we begin from a, the statement that all beans in this bag are white, the last sentence here, okay? 
and this bean is from this bag, then we can say this bean is white. Now, this is certain. The first is statistical, this is certain. This is mathematical type, type one knowledge, this is type two or type three knowledge. Um, scientists use both and historians use both to try and deduce from many traces the facts. Now, let us return to 3rd December and assume we have uh, gathered some facts, okay? We have some facts and we start placing them there on a timeline because history is a lot about that, huh? saying what happened when. We put our facts on a timeline from the day of the, the previous day, December 2nd, to the evening of December 3rd. Okay, that's, that's good. We have something. We have advanced traces, facts, now in an ordered way. And let's look at what these facts may be. With yellow, I have the, a fact that many historians will doubt. But some of these facts that we can be pretty sure, let's say, about for one at some beginning level, at least that at 5 p.m., around 5 p.m. of the previous day, the government forbids the demonstration. That at 8 p.m., EAM insists the political organization on the demonstration. On the next day at 6 a.m., Rizos passes, the party, the newspaper, Communist Party newspaper, calls for the demonstration. At 8 a.m., the police chief warns the government of a plan for the demonstration to turn into revolt. At 9 to 11 a.m., crowds converge on Sidangba Square. That's the trace that General Scobie describes coming to his office. At 10.50 a.m., a grenade is thrown against the prime minister's home a little before the demonstration starts, a different direction, and that is quite well documented, but it's not where the shooting occurs. At 11.05 a.m., as first demonstrators reach square, shots are fired from demonstrators. That is the government view, okay? And there is not much substantiation for that. Very few traces for that, so I have it in yellow. At 11.05, shots are fired against crowd by the police. That is more or less certain. Okay, so we've put everything in order. And uh, do we know these facts, at least in the sense of type three science? Are they facts that we can more or less ascertain from the traces and put in a scheme? Yes, but with varying degrees of certainty. And in that sense, we should keep induction in mind always in history, that knowledge of many things in history is statistical, and we can set our own threshold, our own limit for what reasonable doubt means. You know, in trials, when a mathematician goes to a trial and hears the judge at the end of the trial say, it was proven that, he's totally shocked. Because in his mind, nothing was proven in his own sense. There are indications. But if judges went by the uh, truth standards of mathematicians, there would never be a court decision of, of guilty in the history of the world. So they have a notion of reasonable doubt, and a scientist, a historian, will use reasonable doubt and set their thresholds. Often, a historian will attack another historian because they will say that is not at all, so that is very doubtful. So that is a risk you take. That's part of the science to set your limits for reasonable doubt. So we know these facts with varying degrees of reasonable doubt. The least uh, the highest doubt is for the fact that the demonstrators began to fight f to fire first. Is this history? Well, it is, yeah, but we can do better, okay? It's a form of history. It's, it's analytic, it's chronological, it is putting facts in order, and as soon, to the extent that we are certain of the facts, it certainly is some kind of history, this putting on the timeline the facts. Now, these are annals, though, you would call them in ancient history, chronological lists of what happened. And the best description of the passage from annals to history, which is not, uh, which is not diachronic, it, it is structural, I have found in the book of a famous novelist, E.M. Forster, some of you may have read The Passage to India, who wrote a wonderful book called Aspects of the Novel. And there he wants to describe the difference between a story and a plot. And he says, when you say that the king died and then the queen died, that's a story. But when you say the king died and then the queen died of grief, that's a plot. Okay? Because it includes the notion of cause. And there's a wonderful book uh, for if those of you interested in history. Uh, called uh, The History of Histories by John Barrow, which dis 
talks of almost all the great historians from ancient history until today, stressing the way in which their paradigms shift as to what they are doing with the narrative stuff. Now, we have gone from traces to facts, and now we are putting also causes into the making of a more complex history. And causes, when we have actors, human actors acting in a certain environment, can be external or internal. They can be internal, and internal causes motivation, hatred, ambition, uh, knowledge, the knowledge, say, of a good general, or the mistakes of a bad general, and external knowledge, environment, climate, and so on. The great French tradition of the Annal was a tradition which moved almost everything to external causes, even down to geography and climate and so on, and called almost despairingly the usual notion of a historical event, the événement, the simple event that was not so interesting. They were not using, they didn't like microscopes, they liked telescopes. Um, three versions now of what happened on 3rd uh, of December. We are including some causes, and they are very different versions. First, a peaceful popular demonstration was disrupted by policemen shooting as part of a plan of the government to suppress the expression of people's will. Okay? Second, a peaceful popular demonstration was disrupted. The first is roughly, roughly, and I'm generalizing here with all the dangers of generalization, just to give you an idea, is roughly the uh, left uh, wing historiography view or the official view of the Communist Party then. Second is a peaceful popular demonstration was disrupted by a mindless policeman shooting which, or more, which created havoc, or someone who panicked, created havoc and unintended consequences on all side, sides, bringing underlying conflicts to the surface and having a revolt. It was almost a chaotic event, we might say, which created a terrible mess. Uh, now, this is roughly, if you take the politics of historians, which is not always a good thing to do, sometimes it's a terrible thing to do, but it's a true thing nevertheless. This is more or less the moderate, the centrist, let us call it, view. And third, a seemingly peaceful demonstration was really a plan of the Communist Party to take power, and a discerning chief of police gave orders to fire in order to stop it from turning into a revolution. That is supported by the statement of the chief of police himself, but we have absolutely no reason to take his word for it, because then we would not be doing science. And uh, this is, let us say, the official governmental view uh, narrated, for example, by uh, the Minister of Justice of the government, the Mr. Klis Tsatsos, and also the right-wing historiography view. Again, I don't like to put brands, but just to, to, to in the sh this short time, to have more of an understanding. Now, how can historians decide between them? Okay, you are a historian, an ideal historian, a non-existent historian, that is, and you are a scientist, and you want to do science of history, and you want to decide between them. Which one is true? Uh, one of the great figures in the history of modern thinking was uh, Leibniz in the 18th century, who, at the end of seven, uh, 17th and 18th, who said that everything is down to calculation, that even in the most complex human matters, he said, we will have in the future no reason for war. Because if two countries want to go to the war, their wise men, their leaders will come together and they will say, let us calculate. They will have codified all knowledge concerning human affairs, calculate, and find out should they go to war or not, and who is right, OK? And he even designed a very primitive computer uh, with which he could start as a first step toward such calculations. Even now that we have infinitely more complex computers, we know that this in human affairs is, doesn't really work. Um, so, can history be fully scientific? This is the first big obstacle, complexity. Human affairs are a huge mess. The affairs of, this is the, by the way, nice painting, you cannot see the detail of Little Big Horn, Custer's last time in America. It is chaos, it is a mess, there's too many actors involved, too many motives, too many things, and with complexity it's very hard to be scientific. All of you have heard a lot about complexity recently in science, computer scientists especially, you'll say, but cannot science deal with complexity? We know the theories of complexity. Well, it can, but for example, here we have a wave, 
And as of you who know basic mathematics know, uh, trigonometry can give you a good description of waves. And there is a famous theorem by Fourier that even the most complex wave, the most crazy wave, can be made up of a sum of waves that are as simple as this, described by a trigonometric function. But still, when we get waves like this, we have huge fields like par in, of complex mathematics, partial differential equations, um, uh, numerical analysis, models, chaos theory, whatnot. We cannot, when it gets too complicated, we cannot really talk about it very in gen um, intelligently. So yes, we can speak about uh, complexity with science, but only given enough data, given laws, knowing the laws of hydrodynamics in this sense, or wave mechanics, and that only to a certain degree of complexity, not the kind of complexity that we saw in the Battle of Little Big Horn. With unicausal events, things are usually simple. You know, classic unicausal event, the domino effect. Something falls here and everything else falls. Then it's simple because our causal chain looks like this. But history never looks like this because the environment is much more complex and there are things that are multicausal. And when it's multicausal, you cannot do the same kind of simple analysis. And this is a hugely simplified diagram of events, let us say December 3rd, the shooting here. What brings this to this? The stand of the government, the psychology of the policeman, the police chief, the, the personal history of the policeman, the, what happened in that breakfast with his wife that morning, uh, the plans of the KKE, and so on. It's even much infinitely complex. And to say that all that can be analyzed in a mathematical way and we can say, let us calculate, is rather naive. And this, of course, would go on to do have more and more. And it's more complex than that. So there is, of course, a mathematical tool that is used in such situations. That's Bayesian probability or inverse probability. The usual probabilistic question is that given A, B, C, D are possible causes of X, each with a certain probability, and that A C occurred, what is the prob probability that X will happen, okay? We know that these things can cause this. For example, clouds can cause rain, uh, cold can cause rain. We know that we have clouds, heavy clouds, and this temperature, what's the probability that rain will happen? There's a formula for that. Bayesian probability goes the other way. It says, we know that it's raining. What is the chance that this was caused by heavy clouds and cold and a certain temperature. And history is exactly like that. We look at an event, we look at what happened, the havoc on December 3rd. We know that certain things could have caused it, but what is the possibility, the probability that anyone caused it? There's a wonderful book, it's by a philosopher, so it's not very practical. I mean, don't try to write your thesis term papers with that. But I think it's good for any historian to have read at least one by Aviezer Tucker called Our Knowledge of the Past, published in 2004. It's a wonderful book on the epistemological paradigm for, for history, very positivist book that we are given by uh, the philosophy of Bayesian probability. Now, more usually, though, historians do something simpler. I don't know, Ms. Uh, Professor Wunneris, if you've ever used Bayesian probability in your studies of uh, Macedonia, but you probably do something simpler, which is some induction, some deduction. But usually there's a third way that not many people know about. They all do it in everyday life, though, all the time. It's called abduction, okay? In abduction, we say, this bean is white. We know that this bean is white. We know that all these, the beans in this bag are white, and we say, therefore, this bean is from this bag. This is also statistical. I leave them all for a moment to see how different they are. And notice that they all play with the same three sentences. This is exactly the type of thinking. Conan Doyle didn't know this, if you love, as I do, Sherlock Holmes. But Sherlock Holmes used that method all the time. And he used to say always that this is deduction. It's not deduction. There's a hair, red hair, on the scene of the crime. There are five suspects. One of them is red-haired, therefore it's him. Okay? That's abduction. Of course, it could be any other red-haired person in London at the time, 
but chances are that it's him because we know from other reasons that he's involved. So abduction is also a statistical process, and that's often the natural way of operation in deducing his, in abducting historical facts. Uh, in Greek, by the way, it is epagogikos syllogismos, induction. Uh, deduction is usually called paragogiki skepsis, not much used in everyday language, but that's the correct logical term. And abduction is apagogi, okay? Therefore, the reductio ad absurdum, although it's reductio, it's abduction. And we see that in the Greek word. Now, second obstacle, that we saw the first complexity, we found some ways around complexity, which are heuristic, we cannot use formula, we use abduction, and the other two methods is part, part. <laughs> Why? Because you cannot be fully scientific. No, I don't know, because we have other ways. That's, that's why I have two other parts in my talk, for you especially. Um, not only won't you get the girl, but you'll also commit suicide. Second obstacle, imagine a scene like we unfortunately see in the, um, on television, or if you go to a football game of people fighting like this, and imagine someone going to them and saying, gentlemen, let us calculate. Which is the better team, Aris or Pauk? Okay, let us calculate. We cannot calculate because there is partisanship, there are vested interests, there are emotions or other, in not, not in football, but in other things, interests, which give in human society the impossibility of this type of objectivity. But aren't the natural science ever partisan? People who read about the natural sciences in newspapers and blogs and so on will hear about the very famous issue of dark matter, okay? If you see a spiral galaxy revolving, uh, according to everything we know about physics, the outer stars should be revolving much slower than the inner stars because there's less gravity to hold them. And so this, it should be like this. The speed should be going out like this with distance, but tragically, it's going like this. So the theory here is that there's a lot more matter there that we cannot see. We call it dark matter. Over 90% of the mass of the universe is supposed to be the type of mass we know nothing about. And there are huge scientific debates, many, many theories about what's going on, and constantly a discussion. But sometimes, in most natural sciences, the aim is to reach a consensus, as for example, uh, so it's not, and that's not the way it is in history, uh, we can reach a consensus, for example, I told you about the double helix, but a little before, a few months before the double helix, the model of the triple helix was proposed by Linus Pauling, who already had, until then, two Nobel Prizes in chemistry, and so that was rather intimidating that he had the view that it's a triple helix. Still, two completely unknown scientists challenged that. So it was settled for them. His reputation didn't count in this. They read the wonderful book of uh, uh, James Watson, The uh, Double Helix, if you want. It's an account of that process. He was one of the two people who discovered it. It's the most wonderful book I've ever read. It's also extremely funny about how real science operates very differently from the idealized model of the perfect rational beings. And another cartoon. So crossing the line from alchemy to chemistry, in case you can't read that. You've turned lead into gold. Good. Do it again. Write a detailed description of how you did it and submit it for peer review. Okay, so uh, sci in science, you cannot just say, I did it, I turned lead into gold. Someone, a scientist would tell this, and this is a wonderful uh, cartoonist, Sidney Harris, who has done many wonderful cartoons about science. And you have the process of peer review, this poor guy wanting to have the paper accepted, and all sorts of monsters which are called, possibly motivated by things like jealousy, antagonism, uh, uh, hatred, uh, inferiority complexes, and so on. But in the natural sciences, these are not enough. They have to be the leggy artists, the rules of the art that would let you go through. And most importantly, the criteria are rational. Personal criteria have to be brushed aside, internal to the science, and the same for all. You do, cannot say, rational means they have to do with reason and not emotion. 
you cannot say he's of an ethnic group I disapprove of. Internal to the science, you cannot say, I think that on a rainy day one should not accept the paper because it's a bad luck. And the same for all, you cannot have one uh, criterion for one person and one for the other just because you want to. And there are three interesting cases here. This is three of my, these are three of my favorite scientists, Rosalind Franklin, the lady who took that beautiful X-ray crystallographic picture of DNA I showed you earlier, the pioneer in DNA research. Sadly, tragically, she didn't get the Nobel Prize. She didn't share it with the others because she had died before that, very young, of leukemia. Now, Rosalind Franklin was very, very strongly minded about her role as a woman scientist in a time when there were not many women scientists, late 40s, early 50s, very few. She was the only female uh, X-ray crystallographer. But although she was, had very strongly feminist views and has been made into a feminist icon for the fact that the others suppressed her role, I don't know if they did or not, they, let her, they, they published with her their first paper, I don't see that they did objectively, we can in no way call what she did feminist X-ray crystallography. She was a feminist and she was an X-ray crystallographer, but her X-ray crystallography was X-ray crystallography. This is Sir Michael Atiyah, one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century. Uh, he fields prize medalists and uh, he's Egyptian, born Egyptian. Uh, he was ve he's very intense, still alive, very intense about ish ethnic issues, about the Palestinian issue, very outspoken, much disliked in certain circles for his view on the Palestinians, very much of the, let us say, the Edward Said Orientalism type of criticism of the West for its stance toward the East. He is a great algebraic topologist. His algebraic uh, topology is not post-colonial algebraic topology. It is algebraic topology, okay? Uh, that is, he, this is Alan Turing, the man who partly, mainly invented the machine we are working from and which today was misbehaving, but now that he's here, ah, there are still some problems. Uh, Alan Turing was gay and uh, the, he did, he's the father of computation theory, but we cannot call his computation, very outspoken about his homosexuality, but we cannot call his uh, computation theory, gay computation theory, or queer computation theory. It is computation theory. Okay, that he was gay was his pride and joy, and uh, he did a lot. He also has become an icon in uh, gay militancy, and rightly so, because the poor man died out of repression by the British government at the time when homosexuality was illegal in England in the 50s, uh, although he was a great war hero, broke the Enigma Code. But he, these three people kept gender, race, and sexual orientation totally different from the science. It didn't enter the science because it couldn't. But uh, can't there be ideological science? Well, there's a very famous, notorious example, okay, Trofim Lyshenko in Stalin's time, who refuted Darwin's theory and said that acquired characteristics can be genetically transferred from generation to generation. That is not what Darwin says. And Stalin, was, he was Stalin's great hero, and supposedly the, the, out of the seeds of these little, uh, the wheat here, he took the, the he, he made them stronger, and then he took the weeds, the weeds of those, and uh, they uh, sprouted forth wonderful wheat. But of course, that's a pseudoscience. Uh, it was a fraud, and there's a wonderful book on that, The Rise and Fall of Lyshenko, on politicized exact sciences. So, let's go back to it. How do we decide on what happened on th th the 3rd December? Which of the three out uh, possible outcomes that I stated? We can't with science. We have to go to the judicial version. We have people quarreling, and they're all serious people. And the usual peer review and leggy artists of science and peer community are not good enough. So we are entering something that looks like a judicial mentality. Two people are on two sides, and they have their vested interests. And we, we shall allow them to uh, argue about them. 
the great figure here, I would think, in this turn in the humanities, the counter to the positive view, view of uh, humanities, is a very fundamental Western thinker, John Battista Vico, who wrote his Scienza Nuova uh, to introduce in the 17th century geometrical method into practical life is like trying to go mad with the rules of reason. It is attempting to proceed by a straight line among the labyrinthine paths of life, as though human affairs were not ruled by capriciousness, arrogance, opportunity, and chance. And he still calls his book Scienza Nuova because it is about human science, which he says cannot be built on the more geometric or the geometric way, which was then the idealized model. So this is, a re he was not a revolutionary at the time. He was not taken very seriously. He was rediscovered centuries later, really, his seminal importance. But today, this different paradigm for the so human sciences, which involve human beings, which are not rational players, and have their intentions as various central parts of their actions, is a different point of view. These are five great historians who, all five of them have written on the French Revolution. They have written very different accounts. They are uh, from left to right, uh, Michelet, Thomas Carlyle, Lefebvre, Furet, and uh, Sh Simon Sharma. They have, all five have written famous books. Uh, Sharma is the latest in 85 on the French Revolution, and they're all very different books. And give different accounts. They're all great books, they're all great historians, and they all disagree. So what do we do about that? But let's not worry about the French Revolution. We have enough trouble with our own. And go to four historians who have written narratively about accounts that in, uh, refer to that day. They are from left to right, um, <clears throat> Monty Woodhouse, uh, Johnny Atridis, Yorgos Margaritis, and Solon Grigoriadis. All four of them, in their histories of the period, have accounts of that day, and they are all different. Now, I, uh, first, the, my, the first strong statement that I will make is that all their versions have some differences which are, in theory, reconcilable decidable, a mathematician would say, given enough traces and the application of modern histories, legae artists, the rules, the laws of the art, which are closer to the judicial modern and not the scientific. I say that there are certain things on which they disagree, which in theory, given enough data, we can do, go beyond, and have solutions that they all might agree with. What are they? Let me give you some examples. Okay, these facts on what happened on the third are decidable in a way that satisfies everyone. My footnote is, well, almost everyone, except fools, fanatics, people who believe that Elvis Presley is still alive, or that Greeks are being sprayed. Okay? Some people will not be convinced anyway, so no reason to worry about those. So, who fired first, the police or the demonstrators? Given enough traces and a functioning community. There's no reason why we cannot discover that. In any case of one, whether it was the police or demonstrations, was this a random sudden reaction of individual decision or of one of more people or the result of an order? And if so, who issued it? Was there an order from the government to fire on the demonstrators? Were any armed people among the demonstrators and or did they use their arms? Was there a plan by the leadership of the KKE? to use the demonstration as an attempt to take over government buildings. The reason I'm saying that these are decidable is that if you can only imagine certain traces, for example, certain documents, an archive of the KKE, or a hidden uh, archive of the government, the secret archive of the government, that will give us enough evidence to decide on this in a way that has to be accepted because it's inductively very strong. There's a lot of evidence. You know, postmodernists like to say that there are no historical facts sometimes, but that is an extreme statement, and there certainly are historical facts. And if you want to falsify, to say that it is not true that Adolf Hitler was the leader of Germany during the Second World War, I cannot think of what kind of, of information would prove your claim, okay? So obviously there are degrees of certainty. Now, decidability of this kind depends on the quality of the arguments, but also on the quality of the court. Here I have it generally, I don't know if it's generally, but uh, respected for the international, the human rights uh, 
uh, against crimes of humanity, the International Court in The Hague. Um, as in natural sciences, it depends on good scholarship, good rhetorical technique, which means good persuasion, good scholarship, good writing with good standards and a healthy community of peers. That is necessary because, again, take a crowd of fanatics or people who are convinced of a type two star theory that history is that way regardless of what reality says, they may not be convinced. But given those things, theoretically, these issues are decidable. And the instruments of persuasion in science, in natural science, or in history are more or less the same. They are the instruments of persuasion developed in the fifth century in a criminal trial. And it is a speech. Each side has a speech, which has a prologue, states what is to be proven, at what we think is truly the case. I will prove that this man is guilty of this crime. What laws apply in judging it? Yes, although he killed the other person, he's not guilty because it's a case of self-defense. Statement of facts states what we know in a way supported by the traces. I will bring witnesses to show you that he went there, saw this man, the other man wanted to kill him, and therefore he had to act in self-defense. In history, this takes the form of a long narrative, and it's the main part of what many people think of as history. Proof argues inductively, deductively, and abductively for the more contestable points of the statement no one will argue that there's demonstration. You will not find a new history paper arguing that there was no demonstration on the 3rd of December. Everyone accepts that. That is non-contestable. If there's a dead body in the trial, all sides accept there's a dead body. The question is who killed him, so or her. Uh, so as in the case of a trial, in history, uh, sorry, in proof, we take the is contestable points of the statement, which includes refuting the opposite side's claims. We know that the other guy says it was not self-defense, it was malice, so here we will have to counter his own arguments. And in epilogue, the epilogue repeats the main points to be proven, and especially in a jury trial, appeals to the emotions. But that's especially with a jury. Uh, some of the basic tools of this are what Aristotle, it's all there, called non-artistic proofs, atechnipistis, traces or evidence in history. This should be used as much as possible in trial, natural science and history. Artistic proofs, and endechni, syllogisms or reasoning and arguing. This should be used as little as possible. There's a beautiful passage in the rhetoric of Aristotle which says never use too much logic. If you use too much logic, it's suspect. It shows that you don't have good evidence. And that is the truth in natural science and in history. Okay? If you have one tiny little fact in history that someone said that he thinks that he saw someone in the demonstra among the demonstrators holding a machine gun, and you build a 20-page paper with logical reasoning saying that this must be the case because of this and appealing to universal laws of logic, it's not strong. Ethos is the character, the speaker's ability to convince. Why does this man know? I'll tell you of a recent... Um, development in physics that sets in uh, doubt the basic paradigm of physical science. I know because I have a Nobel of science in physics, okay? You tend to hear very carefully. I'll tell you this because I heard it on television. You don't think it's that important. Pathos, emotion, an appeal to the emotions or prejudices. This count in jury trials, but not so in those ruled by judges. Rule, those ruled by judges mostly go by facts, or ideally. And logos, speech as logic. These are the three tools Aristotle describes, ethos, pathos, logos. These are arguments, and in a courtroom, they are much better with judges than with juries. If we go back to our friends here, in all the versions, there are also some irreconcilable differences, even by the application of the judicial methodology. And let's forget again the French. I'll give you some examples of things that are irreconcilable. You cannot think of any amount of traces, logically discoverable new traces or new arguments that will make them all agree on these, for example. Was I right or wrong to resist a government order? It's a question of values. Was the government putting foreign interests above the Greek in aligning with the British? A matter of the way of putting the question, because the, foreign, uh, the government may have thought that Greek interests are the same as the British. Okay? So, and it's all also about the questions asked. Were the interests of the Soviet Union or the Greek people prime in the mind of the leaders of the KKE? 
as above, but also unclear, where most followers of Islam mostly motivated by patriotism or and the ideology, practically undecidable. We cannot, we can find traces if we are lucky, we can in no way conduct a Gallup poll, an opinion poll, or have that kind of information. Was the aim of Islam to take power or to form a national coalition government more to its liking? Unknowable because dependent on was the conflict planned by Anne? We don't, haven't yet established that, whether they wanted to lead to a, to a fight there, to a civil war with that demonstration. How, we cannot go to the next step. Most of all, was the shooting the cause of the December revolt? This is alternative history. History may argue interestingly about what would have happened if this hadn't happened, but that's not history. History is a recording of the past. Therefore, we cannot decide, there's no way we can decide on what would happen if it had not happened. And decidability is almost always the result of basic disagreement on definitions, terms, principles, or the posing of unclear questions. How are resistance and, and collaboration defined, for example? Those are fuzzy terms. It may appear that they are not, but if you look at many examples, they are fuzzy. What is patriotism? What criteria of legitimacy are applied in transitional stages where institutions are non-existent, nascent, or problematic, as in the change from an occupation to a new uh, government, with, with no constitution, no state, no parliament, no elections? How is the good of the country judged? What about right and wrong? Even in mathematics, such issues can play a fundamental importance. So why not in history? You don't pay, pay too much attention to these. These are three axioms. It's so, the so-called parallel postulate, a version of Euclid's fourth axiom, which is the basis of Euclidean geometry. The other two refute this principle in two different ways. First says one parallel line, the second says uh, no parallel line, the other says infinite parallel lines, and they are two very good bases of two very different geometries, but the three don't work together. Each one is good of itself. So even if it, in mathematics we can have parallel theories, why not in history? So especially for recent events, the parallel operation of politics and social memory, we don't just have historians arguing, we have politicians who want to use history, and social memory, which is what you've heard from your grandfather about those events, or your grandmother, or your uncle, or your friend. And these further confuse the disagreement, even for historians, and two wonderful uh, references here with, from people in this room, by Yorgos Andoniou, his paper on the lost Atlantis of objectivity, who discusses a lot the issue of public memory and how it confuses with history, and from Professor Wurnariski's book on the Macedonian question, which shows the way that the issue, historical issue, can be politicized and how politics and diplomacy enter into what might be purely a historical question, you might think. So, these people cannot leave their prejudices aside. Historians cannot. As in a jury, this one thinks, his tie is too blue, I am voting for the other guy. <laughs> or they often give them a new name. A historian will often use the prejudice, but give them a new name, including the name of theory. We used to be old-fashioned, now we are postmodern, says the couple. Okay? We've often heard the word postmodern is that applied to quite extreme views, which are really quite traditional, even archaic. So to resort to extrajudicial means, so many historians, unfortunately, resort to extrajudicial means, and I mean within the community of scholars for settling arguments. Here okay, the one mathematician says to the other, you want proof? I'll give you proof. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, yet the problem is more than mere partisanship, ideological or methodological. This lady here says it's an excellent proof, but it lacks warmth and feeling. And of course, in a mathematical proof, this is not exactly nonsense, but so put, it's nonsense. But it is also true in history that pathos <coughs> Emotions cannot be excised from human discourse, nor is logos, logic, just logical in human discourse. Which brings us to the final point of view of events, the literary version. And with literary version, I mean the storytelling version, which includes both logical and non-logical things. In the complex diagram we saw of historical events previously, 
The arrows always indicate time. History is always directed, okay? We can have flashbacks in a narration, but it goes that way, and time is linear as we perceive it. But also, sometimes they are causal. This happened, be this happened, this after this, after this, but sometimes this because of this. And a classic log logical fallacy is called in Latin post hoc ergo propter hoc, which means after which, therefore, because of which, okay? Primitive thinking. The, 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 the rooster crows every morning before dawn, therefore the sun rises to answer to the rooster, okay? Called by the rooster. Or uh, any kind of thinking that the child may have, or some mentalities, but mistakes like that can also occur in science and especially in history, so we should be aware. Now, what history is, is what people do, what people have done in ancient times when faced with a huge problem that they have to narrate this in a linear form. So they have to project a nonlinear network into a linear form because time is linear. I'm speaking to you in linear time, second after second after second. If you read the book, it is second after page after page after page, word after word after word. There are non-linear non -linear media. For example, you may say the internet, but again, the internet, when you go from one linked hyperlink to the other, you go in consecutive order. Even in a painting, it's known from visual research, if you look at a huge painting, which seems highly non-linear, the eye moves from point to point, scanning it in order to understand its structure. There are structures which are non-linear, but we tend to linearize by the way we look, by the way we narrate, and history, written history especially, is by definition linear. So how do you put a non-linear network into a linear line? And the cognitive, that's exactly the cognitive importance, the logical, not the emotional, cognitive importance of narrative comes from the fact that it is the optimal tool that people have found for representing in linear form the non-linear directed networks of events which connect the events of history. It is not ideal because it misses a lot by being linear, but it is an optimal tool. And one, the great revolution in the social sciences, often called the narrative turn, really started in 1985 with the theoretical basis of a paper by a great developmental and cognitive psychologist, Jerome Bruner, who said there are two modes of cognitive functioning, two modes of thought, my underlining, each providing distinctive ways of ordering experience of constructing reality. They are the analytical, scientific, and the narrative. These, though complementary, are irreducible to one another. We cannot say exactly the things we say in science with narrative or the other way. Now, why is this revolutionary? Everybody knows that there's storytelling and that there's science and logic. The revolutionary thing in this paper is that he calls narrative a way of thought, not a way of aesthetics, not a way of amusement, not a way of entertainment, not a way of a description, but a way of thought, and there is an awful lot here. So, the thinking mode of narrative, if we ha describe what happened, in a sense we are doing thinking, because we are not an an analyzing a complex reality. The wonderful gentleman here is one of my heroes in classical thought. He's not a Greek, he's a Roman, it's Quintilian, a great theoretician of, of rhetoric, who was the one in whose work the Institutio Oratoria is laid particular emphasis on the role of narrative in uh, forensic discourse. The th this is not a quote from him, it's some of his ideas. The thinking mode is close to the forensic judicial form of narratives, also dominant in history. It depends on the logical function of storytelling, the presentation of action in a linear form in a way aimed at convincing someone that it is the representation of true facts, events, and also the causes which connect them. Notice the jump from presentation to representation. I tell you a story. It's my version of it, my own story. I want to convince you, if I'm a historian, that this is what actually happened. So there is a jump here, and the bridge is the narrative. In a trial or history, they are contested by other narratives. If I offer a narrative and another historian say, Mr. Margaritis has a narrative and Mr. Iatridis wants to have, or Mr. Antonio, a counter-narrative to that, they will use counter-narratives. They will say, not this, but that. 
And also they will use sub-narratives. They will say, yes, he shot, but you see, we know now that he had seen someone about to shoot from the other side. So by adding detail, you elucidate motives and get further into causal explanations. And if you want to know more about this, you can read a long and rather technical paper I have written on the genesis of proof. It's, also, it's in a book uh, published in America, but it's also on my site. It's called uh, A Street Card Named, Among Other Things, Proof. Now, what else? This is my, one of my best ever quotes of all time. For what else is narration but proof in continuous form? And that is in Quintilian. I have given him here his full distinguished Roman name in his great treatise on rhetoric. And this is an astounding statement because two millennia before Brunner, it connects to totally different ways of thinking, the narrative and the logical. It says, what else is narration, the narration in the trial, but proof in continuous form? And he continues to say, and what is proof except narration taken apart? But there's another story there, again, a favorite painting of mine. This is by Rembrandt. Uh, uh, Aristotle looking on a bust of Homer. And it's interesting that we have the great philosopher looking on the great poet with a sort of longing. And as we know, Aristotle, among other things, has also written the poetics and rhetoric, of course. And this opens a gate that there is more to narration than the mere logical accounting of facts which proves things. Because Thucydides, who, who many call the father of history, prefer him to Herodotus, has been highly influenced by the judicial tradition of his days, by the sophists, which, who also worked with, with in the judicial system. And we know that many of his discussions are really like trials. So if in Thucydides this, the science comes, or the magic comes from the judicial form of thinking, before him was a Herodotus. And Herodotus was much closer to Homer. Herodotus' history is much more epic. There are also accounts, also discussions, also in arguments in Herodotus, but there are also some in Homer, famously between Agamemnon and Achilles. So there is another way, which is not the logical of narrative, which is also in history. And justice may be blind, okay, and so the type of justice that the scientist tries to achieve may be blind in the sense of dispassionate and nonpartisan. But another guy is blind, Homer. And in Homer, the blindness is a symbol of the imagination. And in any theorist of narrative who goes beyond the logical, we know that the imaginative process of reconstruction of creation is basic to narrative. A famous name here, if you've read or want to read any of that stuff, the importance of narrative and literary style in history is Hayden White, of course. Historians know this well. And again, this is not a quote my, uh, by my encapsulation of his main idea. A historical narrative is not a transparent medium for facts, events, and causals, not a neutral container, not a clear glass through which we see history. It is a distorting mirror that transforms realities in ways that are particular to its characteristics as a cognitive cultural tool. These are judged by criteria developed in the study of literature. Hayden White is loved by many and hated by many historians for introducing or rather reintroducing or pointing out and stressing the fact that historical accounts are also literary works and also prone to influences from literature. And if you read Metahistories, you may agree or disagree, but it's a great book. Storytellers through the ages have used various forms to tell stories, classed as genres or subgenres. Moretti, who's a brilliant scholar studying the, in Stanford, studying genres he, with a lot of quantitative material, has a rule almost that any subgenre lasts almost 30, about 30 years. And he has amazing evidence to document it, which makes you think of what an adaptive function these supposedly aesthetic forms may be playing. There is no perfect form. Each is determined by time, place, culture, subject, matter, social, personal, and rhetorical criteria. In, time, in our times, we can live this. Do some people like opera? Yes. Do some hate it? Yes. Does that make it an obsolete form? No. For some, it's wonderful. Some prefer television. Some prefer novels. Some prefer short stories. Some long stories. Some police novels. Some romantic films. Some long series. Some individual telefilms. There's no ideal form, 
as there's not for us aesthetically, there's no preference in history. Things change. And these storytelling genres are also affected by other forms of discourse outside literature. Every form of literature can be influenced also from forms outside it. For example, types, here are some type of genres, literary genres that have affected history. <coughs> Epic lyric poetry. Epic and lyric. Homer. Folk oral storytelling, Herodotus, tragedy, very much, Euripides, legal discourse, Thucydides, and many others too, okay? Epidictic rhetoric, later, Plutarch, saints' lives, the whole tradition of biographical history, comedy and satire, very much so f certain uh, refer um, enlightenment historians. The historical novel, Walter Scott, a, a novelist, was a huge revolutionary in history writing. People wrote history after, differently. Macaulay, for example, the great history of England, is in Walter Scott's tradition. Opera, Carlyle writes often as in opera with great passions, lyric explosions, 19th century melodrama. Any history that is chauvinistic, jingoistic, nationalistic, often uses the categories of melodrama, biological, genealogical treatises, or science, very much so, the Annal, Brodel romantic drama, Schiller, and so on. Again, many more dramatized popular histories which are also good history. The realistic novel, a basic staple of modern history. Hollywood cinema, emphasis, too much emphasis on persons now. Documentary cinema, too much emphasis on facts. All these have interacted and helped. And here are some notions, just to give you an idea of the complexity of literary concepts that apply to history. Think of each and every one. It originates in a form of aesthetics, but has to do with history, dialogue, narration, description, irony, interior monologue, characterization, ekphrasis, the description through words of an image, point of view, focalization, which character are we looking at the story through, montage, empathy, feeling for a character, identifying, passion, parallel action, you know that, flashback, flash forward, causal plot, or randomness. Read Tolstoy, for example, and you'll see how, what a big point he makes in War and Peace, especially of the role of randomness in the construction of actions. So all these notions can, those of you who have read history or a lot of history especially, will see cases of all of those. And so we cannot rule out literary style. For example, let me give you my own very... Uh, rough reading of the four historians we talked about. Woodhouse is a Brit, is a Briton, and his history is like the realistic novel. There's an omniscient narrator, the writer, third person, and he tries to be objective, although ironically he was the only one who also participated in the events, but not on December 3rd. Iatridis is very much influenced from diplomatic history, which is a lot like legal discourse, rich in sources, polyphonic, one against the other, trying to find proof. Margaritis, heroic, dramatic, more like <coughs> Carlyle, mutatis, mutandis, uh, strongly and obviously partisan, victory and defeat are great notions in his history, which are legitimate literary styles. Grigoriadis, journalistic, which is the most deceptive of all. I'll just give you the facts, tell you simply what happened. And that is very deceptive, because in the name of simplicity, you can believe anything. So, we are almost... Dan, can someone check at the, the hashtag? And tell us if we have any tweets from the square. There I go. Echme Merka. Echme. Okay, I will read to you, I will read, some are in Greek, uh, but I will read to you in English. I will, may pass 140 characters, excuse me. After the first shots, we heard more shots. The square was filled with blood, bodies, and kapnus. The Greek words kormia, kema, ke kapnus point to you to a literary style. It's maybe a totally legitimate description, but the person writing those has been influenced by a certain spirit. Katevika me stiblatia oles mazi, cosmos polis, ipane diakosis hiliades, ali pedakosis, hathika me mesas to cosmo, then kriona me. 
okay, an impressionism in literary style, also interesting facts. If I may comment uh, to the lady writing this, as a historian would look at this trace of that moment, they would doubt whether it's possible to know that there were 200,000. This is a very good estimate, but how could the participant know that? So this might make a historian think, according to the stemma, that this trace came from another trace. And another person says, follow Doxiadis lecture via Twitter. Yes, very good. Uh, and there's also another one, which is a, a picture uh, a yes, a lady says history is repetitive and underneath shows, my uh, sight is not that good, a picture of, uh, what is it, a policeman, a, a modern, ah, a, mo a, 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 a Turkish, am I right? Turkish demonstration in, uh, in, in Turkey today. Uh, history is repetitive. This is a more or less philosophical comment. Uh, fine. And other, these questions, if they are, someone must read them to me because I cannot read them here. It's dark and I don't have my glasses. Someone must read them to me. But we'll leave them to the end. We have two more slides. So, let me be, say the pros and cons in two slides of storytelling. In defense of storytelling in history, we need storytelling in history. I call it storytelling to include both the logical and the literary modes. It is optimal for blending time and causality, partly because of the narrative nature of action. That's a great book by the British historian David Carr, who says that one should not be too harsh with Hayden White and the literary theory, literary history point of view, attacked by many anti-postmodernists, because action, human action, is itself is narratively constructed. Read the book, it's an interesting thesis. It gives continuity to fractured material. Often we know, you remember the list with the 10 facts. Uh, Gre Greece is losing, by the way, I have information here. <laughs> Serves them right. Okay, uh, it gives continuity to fractured material. So we, you saw the little facts we have on that date. A, a narrative connects them. It unites human actors, their intentions, their actions, and the consequences, which is very important because it gives a unified whole. It feels, it not feels, fills, should be F-I-L-L-S, spelling mistake. It fills the gaps of reality, but also the gaps of information. We may not know what happened, but reading an account, we think we know everything. It creates empathy, humanizing the discourse, making us be there, and that's important because to understand the human predicament, we don't just need facts. It persuades of the connection and necessity of chains of action. It makes what happened look rational in the sense of necessary. The latter is also the major paradox and the major problem, I would add, of plot. The more clean cut and gripping, the more it discounts factors such as chance, error, and disorder, which are characteristic of human life. Any Hollywood storyteller will tell you this. Any Hollywood good screenwriter tell you that to have a good script, you must not too much rely on chance or chaos or error. But in life, and especially in history, it is so. So the more interesting you make it, in a sense, the less truthful, in a sense. Again, storytelling in history. It fills the gaps of reality and the gaps of information, but by filling them, it sometimes hides them. There's nothing like a good story to go over an area when we don't really know what happened. It persuades of the connections and necessity of chains of action, but without these connections and necessity being true. I remind you of the two pictures at first, the policemen and the dead bodies. It may be the case that they were shot by these people or people like them, but I could have taken any random picture and formed in you that impression of a causal connection because of the form of the medium. It relies too much on words, which are vague, undefined, and can be easily distorted by emotion, and what's more, have different meanings for each one of us often. It is highly effective in manipulating emotions, and that is a good thing for propagandists, but a bad thing for people who like to use their mind. That's Plato's critique of storytelling, one of the critiques in Book 10 of the Republic. It treats entities, groups, institutions like persons, it personalizes. EAM, the government, KKE, 
and thus often distorting complex realities and leading to simplifications and fanaticism. When you personalize one of the main roots of fanaticism, nationalist fanaticism, is the personification of a nation, which you see in the period you have studied beautifully in the sense of Greece or Bulgaria or Europe or the Balkans or whatever, or the Antant grasping uh, her children as a wonderful mother. That all is in the narrative medium. So in the end, we come up with a model in which scientific, judicial, and literary truths come together, overlap, are partly independent, say, regarding facts, or, say, regarding different views that are equally legitimate, or, say, regarding the adornments of the stylistic, the dressing, let's say, on the cake of history, Sometimes they will come together, scientific and judicial may come together in evidence, scientific and literary may come together in the use of evidence, and judicial and literary may come together in the logical function of narrative. And of course, in an ideal world, we would like all three to collaborate, but that is very rare, and it's in the nature of the material and nature of human science to have all three all three. I think what is important is to understand all three are there and to understand that they all play valuable roles, but also which one we, oper we are operating at any moment and which are the different laws of each one. So, thanks very much. As they say in football, to which everyone has gone now, uh, we, have, we have had a delay of 20 minutes due to various technical problems for which we all apologize and I may have gone another 10 minutes over my appointed time for which I personally apologize. Uh, we have some questions. We have some written questions. Yes? No? No? Real questions? Live questions? Actual questions? Comments? Anyone? No? All clear? Yes? We can turn the lights on if you want now, please. Now, now, um, you brought up three cases with, um, I believe, three different scientists. One you mentioned representing uh, right. gender, yeah, yeah, homosexuality. gender, gender, uh, race, and uh, or uh, uh, nation and. Uh, Sexual orientation, yes. Yes. So um, I was just wondering in the sense of you, at the end, um, you contrasted storytelling and history and then a more, I suppose, scientific uh, sense of history, but wouldn't both types of history be represented or written by the same types of people? Because thus far in history you have... Um, Yes. The three representations okay. I, are the anomaly. I see your point. I, see your point. Uh, I think, yes, in scientific history, ideally, that was my point on decidable points. In the scientific approach, you can factor these out. You can factor these out. You cannot say that, for example, a certain person's view is there because it, he's partisan, he's a member, of, say, of the Communist Party. That is in certainly a factor that may affect the way he or she presents the history. But if we are talking facts, ideally in a scientific examination, the part where science is applicable, that could be factored out. My point is that it cannot be factored out of everything. It cannot be factored out of the subject matter. The people acting in history have gender, have nationality, have race, have sexual orientations, and those sometimes play a factor, okay? And also, the writer of, of these points of view may be consciously adopting one point of view, say a feminist point of view of the uh, Civil War, and that may make many legitimate and interesting points, both on the judicial raising arguments or the literary composition. But in the science, I said that, in the, I, I used, raised this in the part on science, and I said there, ideally, if it's good science, that should be factored out. That should be something that you can go beyond. Thanks. Someone else? No? Okay. So, thank you very much.